I need a beer. I don't know what to do. I want a beer that's refreshing. Something that uh, is perfect on hot days and something that I can brew, condition, and serve in less than 30 days. But I don't know what. What? I believe that brewing and barbecuing are two important life skills that can bring neighbors together and strengthen communities. This channel is here to help you elevate these skills so that you can be the glue that binds your neighborhood together. Well, what do you think we did? We decided to brew some more beer. The ultimate lawnmower beer. The Hefeweizen, the recipe we formulated consists of about five pounds of Pilsner malt, about five pounds of pale wheat malt, and some rice hulls to help ensure that we don't get a stuck sparge, uh, some hops that we've got on hand, some yeast that we've got on hand, but that grain, yeah, we don't have any pale wheat malt and we don't have any rice hulls, so we're going to have to go get it. It's 98 miles to the closest homebrew shop. We've got a full tank of gas, an empty keg of beer, we need grain, and we're wearing sunglasses. Hit it. Now that we have all the ingredients, it's time to carefully weigh out the grain, add it to our bucket, and get cracking. Wouldn't you know it, the trusty grain mill died on us. I've used this thing for about seven years and it appears the rollers were worn out. As a dad, I think it's important to teach your kids good life skills, such as perseverance. And I'm not raising them to be quitters. So I did what I had to do. I jumped online and I bought a new mill. This time a three roller with a bigger grain hopper. I use a gap of 0.045 inches or 1.14 millimeters, which creates a fairly coarse crush. My system uses five hoses, four short ones and one long one. You basically just move the positioning around, depending on whether you're mashing, sparging, cooling, and transferring the wort. The first step to fire up the system is turning on the element in the hot liquor tank and recirculating the water in the hot liquor tank and the mash tun. The mash tun water moves through a manifold inside the hot liquor tank and is heated by induction. I believe that's right. Pour in your grains and don't forget to stir them with your trusty mash paddle. Stirring helps to ensure that you don't have any dough balls or spots where the grains are sticking together. Think thinner mash, greater attenuation, and thicker mash, more residual sweetness and more maltiness. To step up temperatures, all you have to do is raise the temperature of the hot liquor tank and the mash tun temperature will follow. I'm raising the temperature to 168 Fahrenheit and holding it for 10 minutes. We do this to stop all enzyme action since we've already achieved the requisite degree of fermentability in the wort. Once mash out is complete, I'll switch my hoses around so the hot liquor tank is feeding water into the mash tun and the mash tun is feeding wort into the boil kettle. It usually only takes me a few minutes to match the pump speeds 
and ensure I'm adding the same amount of water as amounts of ores extracted. I like to shoot for about a 90 to 120 minute fly sparge. Since my mash tun was constantly recirculating while I was mashing, the wort ends up very clear. I generally shoot for about a 90 minute boil in order to reduce DMS or dimethyl sulfide. It's an off flavor that can taste a little bit like cooked corn. The beer only has one hop addition, and it's, uh, it's not particularly much. Just enough for the style. Usually, in the last 15 to 20 minutes of the boil, I can start hooking up my chiller and lines so I can run the hot wort through the chiller or peat exchanger and into my unitank. Depending on how fast I'm moving the wort and the temperature of my water, I can get my wort close to pitching temperature. I usually hold it off for about a day before I pitch the yeast though. I like to let all things settle out and occasionally I'll remember to drop the troop before pitching yeast and oxygenating. If you're gonna take the time to brew beer that you're proud to share with your neighbors, you might as well take the time to make a good starter. Now we sit and wait while the yeast works its magic. When the beer has reached the appropriate level of fermentation, it's time to cold crash it. If you don't have the ability to cold crash, it's no big deal. You could transfer to kegs, add gelatin, and carbonate. I just like maximizing the capabilities of the Unitech. Speaking of maximizing the capabilities, this is actually the first beer that I've decided to carbonate using the carbstone inside the Unitech. I'll probably put out a short video discussing the things I learned and how to dial in the appropriate pressure. We package this using a closed pressurized transfer or we maintain the level of head pressure in the keg to keep the carbonated beer from foaming up. I've got a video on how to do it. Fairly straightforward process and once we get the beer into the keg, we'll let it condition for five days because that's all we have left before Lee and his crew show up. Man. I sure hope he likes it. Dude, we've come 3,500 miles from Arlington, Virginia to get a taste of this Hefe Bison that you can't stop talking about. Well, first, this oil machine needs an oil change. So we're gonna have to hit the auto zone and do a project, and then it's gonna be relax mode activated. Oh yeah! Hey man, I think it's this bolt right here. Move, move the pan. This FA Bison is freaking ridiculous. After changing the soil, do I have any on my face? Yeah. DIY, that's what I say, DIY. Dude, you're absolutely right. There's nothing better than DIY oil changes and DIY beer. Well, I'm sure there are things that are a lot better than that, but why don't you check out this video that will show you what I did to overcome foaming issues while bottling beer for competitions.